Amen. Okay, we're starting a new series. Super excited about this. We've had this one planned for months. Not my sermon plan. That just got finished this morning. But the series was planned for months. And we're going to be jumping into the book of Romans. Uh, Romans, man, one of the most famous books of the Bible, honestly, throughout church history. And let me just tell you a little bit calendar-wise how this is going to work. We're going to spend the next 10 weeks looking at the first seven chapters of Romans, take a break for the holidays. We'll come back in about second or third week of January. We'll pick up with another nine or 10-week series to finish it out. Now, Romans, man, I, I got to tell you, throughout church history, it's been regarded as the clearest, purest, most in-depth explanation of Christianity ever presented. And I don't even have time to list all the heroes of faith who came to salvation either by reading, studying, or listening to someone preach on this book. It's amazing the way that the Lord has used, I mean, all the scriptures God breathed, right? But there's something on the book of Romans in the last 2,000 years that has just been very powerful and effective to bring people to salvation. Now, if you've read the book of Romans before, you know it is brilliant. I was going to make a joke. I shouldn't make that joke. I was going to say, unless you're not very smart, then you may not realize how brilliant it is. But it's brilliant. Just trust you know, I just trust the people that are really brilliant and tell me it's, it's brilliant, okay? But it's an amazing thing. And, and, and not just as scripture, but just as literature. You're just like, this is unbelievable. For the first hundred years or so or, uh, of Harvard Business or uh, Harvard Law School, they actually required all freshman students to work their way through and outline all of Paul, Paul's arguments in the 16 chapters of the book of Romans. In particular, paying attention to the way that he anticipates and and answers questions that people would raise before they even raise them. This is something very useful for lawyers. It's just an amazing book, highly theological book, right? And I just say this from the start, it would be a mistake for us to, to go into this series and view Romans simply as theology, which is the way some people approach it. It's great theology. I mean, oh, it is so rich. If you love theology, like you're, you're going to love these next 10 weeks. But let me say this. It's not theology in a vacuum. It's not like Paul sat down and said, okay, everyone's theology sucks. I better straighten them out. I'm going to write this great book of theology and then just present it to all the churches. No, the book of Romans is actually not a book. It's a letter. And it was written to a group of house churches in Rome that Paul was in relationship with. Actually, one fun way to read the book of Romans is to start with the last chapter, chapter 16, because in it, Paul says hi to 28 different people. He's like, oh, oh, can you say hi to this person? Oh, and don't forget them. And also give this person this message. Like the book is so relational. And you have Paul who's just in love with these people from these, these church families, these house churches in this incredible city of Rome. And he's writing this letter to them in order to address some issues that have come up in their churches. Now, one of the things that Paul addresses in this letter is some, some tension that has creeped into these house churches. Now, where did that tension come from? Let me give you a little bit of the backstory so you kind of understand. I, I feel like anytime we read a book of the Bible, you kind of want to step into it, so to speak. Understand the story because it helps everything that said make a little bit more sense. Now, you have the churches in Rome. These weren't churches that Paul planted. Uh, no one knows for sure how they were planted, but many suggest and believe that on the day of Pentecost, if you remember that day, Holy Spirit came, you had the 120 people, disciples of Christ, they rush out into the street, they're all speaking in tongues, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they're doing so in all these different languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And you actually had people from Rome who were there on that day. And many believe that those people, several of them, had this incredible encounter with Jesus, heard Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, go back, having given their lives to Jesus, and they get back to Rome, and they do what every Christian has done throughout history who has gotten saved and gone back to their city. They're like, all right, we're followers of Jesus. We better start a family. Come, we're going to meet in my house. We now are a church. Okay, so you have these Jewish believers, primarily just Jewish believers, creating these house churches all throughout Rome. And then over the next several years, 
as they have this message of, of Christ that's gripped their heart and changed them so much, they begin sharing that message with other people, but not just with Jews. They begin sharing that message with non-Jews, known as Gentiles. Now, Gentiles start giving their life to Jesus, and they start joining these house churches, which creates some tension, but, but they're getting along all right. And so you got Jews, and you got Gentiles together in these house churches until AD 49, when the emperor Claudius got mad at the Jews, gave an, uh, an edict and said, every Jew must leave Rome. And they're like, when? He's like, now, get out now, just leave. How many of y'all have people in your life where you wish you could just say that to them? <laughs> just leave right now, just, just do it, okay? So that's essentially, I mean, if you're emperor, like that's, that's what you get to do, just leave and they have to leave. And if they don't, you kill them, okay? So this is what Claudius does. Now, all the Jews are forced out of Rome. What does that do to the house churches? Well, now these churches are just filled with Gentile believers who don't live like Jews. They don't live under the law and those same custom and ceremonies that were given them under the old covenant. And they have years of this with the Jews absent from the house churches. And then several years later, the Jews are allowed back into Rome. So they come back and they're finding places to live and they go, oh, let's go to church. Come on. And they begin to reintegrate into these house churches which creates a lot of tension. Let me give an example. How many of you are married and have kids? Not yet, okay, but we got someone that wants to be. Okay, praise God. <laughs> married, have kids. Okay, how many of you that have been married and have kids, either you or your spouse have left on a trip for at least longer than three or four days? Okay, can you remember what, what that's like? Sarah and I have done this many times right? One spouse leaves and the spouse is at home and it's kind of rough. You're, you're with the kids, you're by yourself, but you begin to figure things out and you kind of have your way of doing things, your way of making breakfast, your way of how the kids are going to do chores, when they're going to do chores, what bedtime's actually going to be. Like you kind of get in this groove and you're like, this is nice. I get to do things my way all the time and I don't have to give in to any other person with their ideas, and then, inevitably, your spouse comes back. And then you're just like this reintegration moment, right? Of like, oh, wait, I can't just be in control and have things my way and the way that I think they should be done. Now I have to give room and space to this other person who I'm married to to come back in. And we're going to have to figure this, this household thing, this parenting thing out again together. Sarah and I have been married for 19 and a half years, and we still haven't figured this out. Like the reintegration is terrible. We always end up in a fight. I'm kind of like, I, I land on the plane. I'm like, babe, can we just fight right here at the airport and just get it over with? <laughs> like, let's just do that, right? And it's usually my fault because I like things my way and I like to be in control, okay? So this is kind of what's beginning to happen in the Roman churches. You've had Gentiles who've just been able to follow Jesus without having to deal with any of the Jewish customs and religion that they brought with them into their adherence to, to Christ. And then now the Jews are coming back and the Jews are like, hey, why aren't you living like Jews? And they're like, well, we're Gentiles. You can't be a, a follower of Jesus and not live like a Jew. This is what the Jews are saying. Now, there was three uh, basic Jewish things that kind of solidified their identity in what's known as the diaspora, them being kind of spread everywhere out from Jerusalem. It was circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and food laws, none of which the Gentiles adhered to. And so there's this tension. Many scholars think that it got so bad that the Gentiles met in their house churches and the Jews met in their house churches. What a great family of God. You're like, this sounds like my family. I mean, can you imagine right now if we, on our sign-up sheets for small groups, segregated each one by race? Okay, hey, the Hawaiians, this is your group. Marshallese, this is your group. If you're Japanese, this is your group. You're white, you're over in this group. Nobody gets to be together because it just creates too much tension. That was their solution. And so Paul's writing this letter in part to address that tension, and saying, hey, guys, this isn't how the gospel works. And there's so much at stake for Paul. Practically, part of what's at stake, at least for the Gentiles, is, hey, do we have to observe all these Jewish rituals, Jewish customs, Jewish laws? Right? 
do we have to do that in order to be saved? The other thing is really, is the power of the gospel is on the line. Does, let me say it like this, is the gospel powerful enough to bring a group of diverse people together into one family known as the family of God? Paul's convinced it is, but these guys weren't living like it. Theologically, some things were at stake. Really, the gospel itself, does right standing come by way of doing the law or by having faith in what's been done for you? Really, Paul's addressing, hey, is Christianity a religion of doing or is Christianity a religion of it's already been done? So there's so much at stake here, so much that Paul's going to tackle. Now, let me give you our strategy. Uh, we are not going to dissect every single book of the verse of Romans. There are preachers who have done that and are currently doing that, and they're about seven years into their study of the book of Romans, and they still haven't finished. Is it worthwhile? Absolutely. Go listen to them. But we just don't have time to do that. So what we are going to do is we're going to highlight passages each week. We're looking at the first 17 verses of chapter 1 today. Not going to look at all of them. But what I would encourage you to do is read through the book of Romans minimum of three times in the next 10 weeks. Now, there's a lot of great ways to do this. I, I had the, you know, I had the Version Bible app, and I was driving in my car. I was like, oh, I just want to listen to Romans 1. And so I, you know, as I'm stopped, I wasn't driving yet, but I'm like hitting play, and I go, oh, there's this new little thing that says, choose your voice. I'm like, oh, this is like Alexa. This is fun. So I choose my voice, and it's like male something, something or other. I was like, great. Now, I've been really into like lo-fi hip-hop jazz music at home, because it's just so soothing. And I think with all the chaos of my children and, and the millions of people that are in my home every single day, I'm just like, let's just set a calm you know, mood in this place. So I, I, back to my Bible, I select this random voice. I was like, great. And all of a sudden, lo-fi crackle music comes on. And this like hip hop artist comes on, like reading Romans 1. I was like, this is the best thing in the world. Praise <laughs> God. And there's all these different voices you can choose from. Find your voice. Find your translation. Find how you are going to listen and or read to the book of Romans. But I'd encourage you, this is on you. You're going to get as much out of this as you put into it. And I, I would suggest to you that there is much to gain from, from this study of Romans as we go, out of this, go, out, go after this over these next 10 weeks. But read through a minimum of, of three times. All right, you guys ready to actually read Romans? Should we do this? Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says this. Paul, it's the guy who wrote it, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome, he's saying not just Gentiles, but Jews too, to all who are in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two things right after, like right off the bat that Paul is wanting us to to know as he's opening this letter. He's saying here, Romans, and, and you have to understand this wasn't just a letter to the Romans. Because it was inspired by the, Holy Script, by the Holy Spirit as scripture, it's a letter to all Christians for all eternity. And Paul's saying, here's a couple things I need you to know right off the bat. Number one is this, you need to know who you are. Paul's saying, let me remind you of, of who you are. Let me remind you of who your identity is found in. And this is what he says. Number one, you're loved by God. He says, this is the mindset I want you to have as you read this, this letter. I want you to sit. I want you to have that understanding. Wow, God is crazy about me. He loves me. Not because of anything I've done. He has just made a sovereign choice to love me. He says, this is who you are. And then secondly, Paul says, also, just a reminder, God calls you saint. Saint. He says, this is who you are. This is your identity. Anyone who has received Jesus, you are, in fact, a saint. Now, this isn't the same way that the Catholic Church uses the word saint. 
You know, for them, the word saint means someone who's typically dead, who's done miracles that have been proven and has lived a very selfless life. Great things, but that's not the biblical definition of saint. Anyone is a saint who has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're like, dang, I didn't know it was so easy. I'm a saint. Yes. That's what Paul wants you to realize. You were loved by God and you were a saint, not because of anything you've done, so you can't take credit for it, but because of everything that God, through his son Jesus, has done for you. Here's the second thing Paul wants you to know. First, your identity, who you are. Second, Paul's saying, look, I need you to know what this letter is going to produce in you. If you read it, if you take it in, here's what it's going to produce in you. Number one, obedience that comes from faith. Paul says, this is why I'm writing. This is why I've been called to bring about the obedience that comes from faith in the Gentiles and in everyone. Now, what does that mean? It simply means the Jesus way of life. That if you take in Romans, it's going to produce in you the Jesus way of life. Now, the order here is very significant. Paul says, the obedience that stems from comes from faith. He's saying, when you come to that point where you receive Jesus... You, better way to say it, you simply believe that what Jesus said he did, that he lived a perfect life because you can't and I can't. He died a death that I deserve, but he didn't want me to have to die. Eternal separation from God and hell. He took that upon himself. Paul's saying, when you just simply believe that, trust it, put your life at stake on that truth. He says, in that moment, something's going to be produced in you and it's obedience. And it's not an obedience that's seeking after the approval of God. It's an obedience that in faith already knows that you are approved by God because of what Jesus did for you. And your obedience is simply the natural response. When you encounter Jesus, you start living the Jesus way of life. But it's empowered by him. This is the beauty. Because this is what else Paul says this letter will produce in you. Grace. He says it's going to produce grace. What is grace? God's favor. I mean, I want to be favored by God. You are, if you're in Jesus. And he says, there's going to be a fresh grace and a fresh favor released on your life by reading this letter and taking it to heart. Uh, another word for favor is power. There's going to be fresh power released in you to live the Jesus kind of life simply by reading this letter. But that's not all. Paul says there's more. Tell them what they've won, Vanna. There is more. <laughs> he says, you also get peace and assurance. He says, it's going to produce peace in you. How many of all would this love a little bit more peace in your life? Sign me up for that. It's a peace, knowing that you're at peace with God now. Paul will say this when we get to chapter five, that we were enemies of God, but now we're at peace with him. It's an amazing statement. Can't wait to get there. But it's a type of peace that can almost be described as an assurance, like an assurance of our standing before God, uh, an assurance of our salvation that we've got heaven to look forward to. This is what Paul says will be produced in you and in me when we actually take in this letter. Now, we're going to jump down to verse 16. Verse 16 and 17 can be really considered the thesis statement of the entire letter. This is what it says. For I, Paul, Paul speaking, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I love that. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation unto all who believe. Oh. Now, depending upon which translation you're reading up to this verse, just in the first 16 or 17 verses, Paul has used that word gospel either four or six times, depending on which translation you're reading. This letter is all about the gospel. It's all about the gospel through and through. And you're like, well, what is the gospel? Like, what does that even mean? It might be helpful for us just to understand where that term even came from. You know, it's such a churchy, Christian, religious sounding term, but we Christians actually stole it. We didn't come up with it. It was actually a very common term that everyone understood in the marketplace, wherever, back in, in the first century. And essentially all it means is good news, a happy message. Hey, I've got something awesome to share with you. But in particular, the way that it was used most often is when a king or an emperor would win a battle. So it'd be something like this. Let's say you're in a, a town or a village in, in the Roman Empire, maybe one on the outskirts 
right? A little bit more dangerous area. And a herald would come into town and gather the village together and say, hey, I've got good news for you. Your emperor, your king has won a great victory for you. You no longer need to live in fear. You are safe. That's gospel. That's literally what it means. And in the first century church, you had Christians, and they're trying to articulate everything that God has done for them in Jesus. They're just like, man, this is just so amazing. Everything, our king has won a victory for us. We don't have to live in fear. We've got freedom. We've got heaven. We've got transformation. And they're just like, what's, what's like that perfect word? What, what word could we use to kind of get it across of like what Christ has done for us? And what they did was they appropriated that term that already existed and they injected it with rich meaning about Jesus' work, his message, his grace. They used it as a declaration of these glad tidings of joy of what God had done for humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what gospel is. Uh, how many of y'all have um, know a person or maybe you are this person who tends to be rather stoic, you know? Someone that not, doesn't express much excitement, doesn't express much anger. They don't express much of anything. Like the type of person you kind of just want to poke their face and be like, does your smile muscles even work? Right? Now, sometimes you've been in conversation with these people and they're just stoic, kind of boring, right? Until you bring up a topic that they're passionate about and then everything changes. And you're like, who are you? You actually have passion and excitement. I've never seen this part of you, right? It's like when they, someone who, who you know to be stoic runs through the door, you're like, you're not gonna believe what happens. And you're like, are you okay? This is kind of different. Are, are, are you good? Are we good, man? Right? And there's something that's occurred to them that they just have to share. They're like, I got, even if they're the most boring person, they're like, I gotta find someone I'm excited. I gotta tell them what just happened to me. It's funny because in our society, this tends to hinge around either sports or dating, right? <laughs> like my team won, or I asked this girl and she said yes, we're so excited about it. It's this excitement, it's this passion, it's this moment of joy and declaration where you're almost beyond yourself and you just gotta speak it out. That's what the early church was trying to express. And that's what Paul is so passionate about. He's like, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. He's like, let me announce this message to you. Let me be a messenger. Let me declare what God has done for you in Jesus so you can receive him and so that you can walk now into the kingdom of the most high God. He had a passion for the gospel. Now, what is the gospel message? I mean, Paul is going to explain it in depth over the next 16 chapters. But to sum it up, like, what do we actually mean? Like, Paul just throws it out there in the introduction. Gospel, 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 gospel. Just says it. What is he actually talking about? I like the way John Tyson uh, says it. He says, the gospel is the good news that God, our Father, the Creator, out of His great love for us, has come to rescue us from sin, Satan, death, and hell, and to renew all things in and through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, to establish His kingdom through His people in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is for God's great glory in our great joy. Now, there's a couple of things we have to understand about the gospel, okay? Number one is this. It's actually news. It's news that needs to be heard. It's news that needs to be announced. It's not something we stay quiet about. I, I think and remember of uh, um, the angels, right, in Luke chapter 2, as they come and they give some news to these shepherds. And this is what it says in Luke 2.10. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. And the shepherds, having received that news, what do they do? They're like, we got to go find Mary, Joseph, and this little baby. Come on, run. We got to share with them this good news that we've just heard. And then they begin sharing it throughout the whole village. The gospel is actual news. The second thing we have to understand about this gospel message is that the message itself is powerful. How many of you have ever listened to a boring sermon? Obviously not here, but ever listened to a boring sermon before? And you're just like, wow, that guy's terrible. But you felt your heart on fire. Because there was something in the message itself, not the messenger. 
This is part of what God is saying about the gospel, that the gospel message itself carries power. You know, some of us are like, oh, Lord, I, I just don't know. If, I don't know if I can ever share the gospel well. I just don't think I'm the right personality. Like we have this view that God's like, okay, I'm only asking people who are like Enneagram threes to go and share the message because all you other personality types are just going to screw it up anyway. So you guys can just sit on the bench and just let all the threes go take care of it. I don't even know what a three is. I just picked one, right? That's not how this works. Because it's not the messenger that carries the power, it's the message. Now, does the Holy Spirit anoint messengers? Absolutely. But in, in, in some way, this really should kind of take the pressure off of you. Because it's the message that actually contains the power. It reminds me of Isaiah 55, where God says, wherever my word goes forth, it will not return void. It will accomplish what I desire it to accomplish. The message, the word itself, carries the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. It reminds me of, of the blind man that Jesus healed in John chapter 9, blind from birth. Jesus comes, finds him one day. It's a Sabbath and, and Jesus spits on the ground, makes some mud, throws it on his eyes, says, go wash in the pool. He comes back and he can see. And Jesus is kind of dipped out, but there's all this uproar. And this guy that, that everyone has seen his entire life begging, who everyone knows is blind, is now seen. And he's telling people why, because it's good news. God, I can see. So the religious leaders, the Pharisees, catch one of this story. And they're just like, what is happening? So they interrogate the guy. And so I guess what you do when... Something good happens to somebody if you're a Pharisee. Just interrogate them. And they said, who healed you? What happened? You weren't really born blind. And then they talked to his parents. And the parents were like, don't talk to us. Talk to him and all this stuff. And so they say, who healed you? And the blind man says, it was this guy, Jesus. How did he do it? I, he just made some mud, put it on my eyes. I washed and then I could see. And they're like, well, it's Sabbath. Clearly this Jesus guy must be a sinner. Who do you think he is? And the blind man's like, well, I don't know. Seems like he must be a prophet of God or something because we know that God doesn't listen to sinners when it comes to things like this. And look, I can see. And the Pharisees keep peppering him with questions. And he finally gets to a point where he's like, guys, I don't have all the answers to your questions, but here's what I know. I once was blind. I encountered Jesus. And now I'm seen clearly as, as you can tell right in front of me. And they're like, and he's like no, no, let me just, let me tell it again. I could not see ever. No glasses were going to, like, I just couldn't do it. And then I met Jesus, and now I can see. And it's one of, like, the most beautiful examples of sharing the gospel, of just giving news. And some of us feel like, man, I got to have a theology degree. I have to, like, study. Like, what if I encounter a Mormon and they ask questions? I better go read everything about Mormon. What about a Jehovah's Witness? I better read everything. What about a Buddhist? And you're just like, I can't do it. God's not asking you to have the answers to every question. It's helpful. But he's saying there's a message that itself carries power. And when that message has grabbed hold of your heart and has changed you, this message that all of us are sinners, like we've just screwed up royally, guys. We're so good at doing that. And our sin has separated us from God and has earned us hell. But God didn't want us to live like that for eternity, so he sent Jesus, his son, God himself in flesh, to live that perfect life, to die, experience hell for us, so that we can be forgiven. Like, you can share that message, and the simple sharing of it, no matter how stinking stoic or boring you are, and some of us are, carries power. That's what Paul wants us to know. He says, the gospel message itself is the power of God. Here's the other thing we need to know about the gospel. The gospel is about God. Ultimately, the gospel message isn't really about you. It's not about self-actualization or self-improvement. It's about him and it's about his plan. One of the ways to think of the gospel is as a meta-narrative, a story that explains all the data that we see in front of us in the universe. Okay, now every meta narrative or every large story that's ex trying to explain basically our existence, why we're here, tries to answer four questions. Number one, why are we here? Number two, what's gone wrong? Number three, what's going to fix it? And number four, what will it all look like in the end when it is set right? 
The gospel answers these four questions, but it does it in a unique way. By putting God at the center and not humanity. Some of us, when we, when we receive the gospel, we're like, wow, God, you have finally entered into my story. God is not entering into your story. You have the opportunity to enter into his. That's what the gospel is. How many of y'all know he's been here a lot longer than you have? Just saying. He's inviting you into a story that's ultimately bigger than you. And whether you know this yet or not, in your deepest longing, you do realize this, that you were created for something greater than you. That there's a longing in every human heart to be part of something that is bigger than simply us as individuals. This is what the gospel is, right? It's the Father who plans our salvation, determining like the very moment in history that his son would come and that you'd be saved. It's Jesus, the son, accomplishing our salvation. He's the one that's done it for us. It's the Holy Spirit bringing those truths of God's plan and the finished work of Jesus into our lives, animating our dead spirits, making them alive so that we can experience the reality of God himself. It's all about him through and through. And here's the fourth thing we need to understand about the gospel, and then we're going to end. It's this. The gospel not only is about God ultimately, but it centers on God's grace and not on our works. There's this great story about C.S. Lewis. You may be familiar with him. Uh, if you're not, you kind of are if you've ever watched the movies or read the books, Chronicles of Narnia. Incredibly brilliant man, theologian, but he was a teacher at Oxford in England. And one day he was walking through the halls of Oxford and heard his name call from one of the, the classrooms. So he goes into that, into that classroom and he finds several of his, his uh, peers, uh, other professors, that are all at a chalkboard. And on that chalkboard, they're writing down all the common traits of the world religions. Things like uh, uh, morality, accountability, judgment, worship. Now, knowing Lewis was a Christian, they challenged him. They said, hey, Jack. Jack was his nickname. I don't know how you get from Clive Staple Lewis to Jack, but that's what they did. They said, Jack, tell us what Christianity believes that is not already listed on this blackboard. They're like, there's nothing special about Christianity. There's nothing that different from all the rest of the world religions. Lewis walks up to the chalkboard, grabs a piece of chalk, writes one word, G R A C period, drops the chalk, walks out of the room. It's grace. Every other world religion is about what you can do, what good works you need to do, which bad works you need to avoid in order to earn favor with God, or as the Mormons would teach, in order to become God yourself. It's only Christianity that says, this is not about you becoming God. God's at the center. This is not about you doing works because Jesus has already done the work for you. This is about grace, God's unmerited favor, a blessing he wants to give you of salvation that you could never earn, never work for, never obtain yourself. This is what's at the center of what it means to actually know and receive the gospel. I love how J.D. Greer puts it. He says, Christianity at its core is not good advice about what we must go and do for God, but rather good news about what he's done for us. It's not primarily instructions in morality or accountability or goodness, but a declaration of grace. This is what Paul's enthralled with. This is the message that's going to fix the tension between Jews and Gentiles, between this group and that group. This is the message that's going to bring about what Paul referred to, and we didn't have time to dive into yet, the righteousness of God in your life and in mine. And the question really for us is, is, is twofold. Number one, have you received that gospel, that gospel of grace, or are you still working under a gospel of works, thinking that somehow if you're just good enough and maybe in the end, you know, the scales will kind of balance out in your favor and God will let you in? Or have you fallen for the gospel of humanism that says, you know what, there is no God, there is no spirituality, it's just you and it's all about you and you are the center of the universe. So the gospel is just live for you, you do you. That is a very heavy burden to carry. Or have you received the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ? 
that he did the work, his perfect life, his death on the cross, the things you couldn't do and only who he could. Have you grabbed hold of it and said, yep, this is who I now am. And secondly, thank you for that background music. The angels are singing. Secondly, have you allowed that? You know, keep it up. Don't turn it off. Secondly, have you allowed that gospel to burn so deeply in your soul that you just can't help but share it with somebody else? Have you come to the point where you actually have more faith in the mess, message than the messenger? Or like, I don't have to know all the answers. I was this way, I met Jesus, and now things have changed. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much, and we're just so grateful for your work in our lives. We're so grateful for the gospel, and we're so excited to spend this time just seeing what you have to say through it, through the Apostle Paul. We're excited to, to be changed. We know that this is going to produce some things in us, Lord. Fresh passion by far is going to be one of them, and we want that, Lord. And so we just welcome that work in, in, in our lives, Lord. Help us to, to know the gospel and just to burn, Lord, with passion for it. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.